So hello everyone, I'm here today with Sarah Wheeler, who is going to be doing a workshop at Awaken the Goddess Festival on the 8th of May. So Sarah, would you mind telling everyone a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, thanks so much for having me on to come and have a bit of a chat before the festival. Um, so yeah, let me see. So yeah, I, I teach yoga. I'm a Hatha yoga and yoga nidra teacher. Um, I live in sunny Brighton, which isn't so sunny today, but as we've just been discussing, we're very pleased to see, like, get the ground a bit wet so the flowers can get happy again. It feels very important at the moment. Um, I'm also a Reiki teacher and Reiki practitioner as well, and um, recently a first-time published author, which is still taking a bit of time to kind of land with me, like, I wrote a book, the book got finished, it got proofed and edited and then designed and now it's real and now it's in the world. Um, so yeah, I've kind of taken a little bit of time to sort of soak in the, you know, I'm not really into like job titles per se, but to kind of soak in the thing of, I am an active author, I write things and they get published. So yes, that's me. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. I'd really like to hear a bit more about your book. Before we go on to that, could you tell me a little bit about, um, so you're doing a yoga, yoga nidra workshop. Sure. What is it about yoga nidra that you really love? Mm, such a nice question. Um, I think one thing to say to start with was that I wouldn't even necessarily call it a workshop when it comes to yoga nidra. I think there's always ways that we can expand and deepen one's practice of yoga but particularly with yoga nidra I think taking the word work out of the experience is an important thing um, and there, there are workshops that exist on yoga nidra I've been to a number and like the the intention of those workshops is to really um, get more like into the philosophy of yoga nidra and the kind of technical, even more scientific happenings of what's actually happening when you're practicing deep rest and yoga nidra like physiologically. So this um, workshop slash offering is gonna be a little bit different from that. So hopefully there won't be kind of too much emphasis on the work in the session. Um, so what we're gonna be looking at is this premise of rest. Um, and I think it's fair to say that people who are women or identify as, as women often have a challenging relationship with rest and particularly relaxation. And I think rest and relaxation are different things and, and we'll probably look a little bit at that during the session. Um, but when it comes to yoga nidra, the part that really attracted me firstly and foremostly actually as a student of the practice was the place that you may find yourself having an experience of during a, a yoga nidra session of this place of stillness and almost like a void going into a void where there isn't actually anything for you to do there's nothing for you to get right it's simply like a place of being and the word um, dra in nidra means void in Sanskrit. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that in the start of the, the session that I'll be running to kind of get into the um, sort of context for what yoga nidra actually means as a kind of three-headed thing, right? So it's, it's a practice that you can hone and work with over time. It's kind of a technique like something that you would do like you'd go to do a yoga nidra class but it's also a state like an altered state of consciousness that you may or may not experience when you do your yoga nidra practice i hope that's making sense it's yes. definitely been something that's taken you know in, in my teacher trainings and in my kind of like progression with getting to know the practice and the historical kind of context for yoga nidra more. That's been this kind of three-headed kind of awareness that you need to bring to it um, as a teacher. People who are practicing, you don't need to like tie yourself up with that in, in knots and try and work out all those things at the same time, but it's helpful to have a context for what's actually happening and how come yoga nidra came to be in the first place. 
but yeah, it's the aspect of really downing tools and being with your body and your mind. And in some cases, some people might say spirit as well in a place where there isn't anything to accomplish. So even the, the idea of trying to accomplish rest can be a barrier to receiving rest and letting rest like visit you, like come to you. Mm. I've said a lot there, there's probably loads to unpick. I'm not even sure I answered the question, but. <laughs> no, absolutely, you did answer the question. And I, I, I think you're right that it is really hard for us to give ourselves the time to take rest or to think of it as something that's valuable and important and self-care can almost seem like something that we'll do one day once all these little boxes are of things that we're accomplishing in our lives and then I'll take care of myself well actually if you took care of yourself now then all those boxes would get ticked a lot quicker anyway right mm -hmm. and, and this idea of of it um as being something that what, what were the words you said something that you receive something rather than you know something that you I don't know there's just something I, to me it kind of feels like oh that kind of takes the stress out of it it's not something I have to work for yeah you know yeah yeah definitely um um we are in the west a very kind of forward-facing go kind of mode society a lot of the time um and that can leave us almost in this kind of high alert state frequently more frequently than what's actually um like optimal or healthy for one's body so when you're kind of in this um not like a heightened state i'm not talking about panic necessarily but in a kind of heightened state of being alert be it like going from maybe job to job, if you're a person who has more than one job to try to make ends meet, or if you're a person who is constantly from meeting to meeting to meeting, and particularly now, like so much more meetings are happening online for people, can get very, very draining. And so this aspect of rest as something being very, um, very beneficial and very crucial that we do with the best of intentions wants to bring into our lives, it can just end up as another thing to cross off on a to-do list. Um, and so when I was doing my teacher training in Yoga Nidra, it's very much one of the things that my amazing teachers, um, Tracy Stanley and Chanty Perez, wanted to kind of um, unlearn out of us that yoga nidra is not something to put on a to-do list. Rest is not for your to-do list. Rest is something which is almost like its own um, kind of entity, if that makes sense, that you're creating your relationship with rest and in doing so creating a deeper relationship and understanding of, of oneself and what could have been a barrier to that, to that rest in the first place. I don't explain it in any way as brilliantly as they do <laughs> so I just butchered that <laughs> um yeah I mean it's a, it's a crucial thing everybody needs rest and there are thousands of people who have so 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 little time to rest for various different reasons you know be they family commitments or the different kind of constraints of a of a socio-economic background that leave people particularly in, in marginalised groups, thinking, I actually can't have, to, I don't have time and I can't afford to take rest because I won't have money to be able to look after myself or my family, you know? So I think it's, it's important to think like, yes, we need to do the self-care. Yes, if we prioritise that. Yes, if we do that now, then maybe things that we do need to get to could like fall into place maybe easier. But the self-care... I think from, you know, a yoga teacher's perspective like myself, who's very interested and cares about like social injustice and change, being on your yoga mat and doing your yoga nidra is one aspect of being a yoga practitioner. Mm. There's other aspects of, of being a yoga practitioner where you are actively encouraged to see that your own liberation, which can be a liberation through rest, deconstructing these layers of, 
I've got too much to do and I'm not good enough and nobody ever taught me to rest and do I even deserve to have this? When you're deconstructing and dissolving those layers that have been in the way of you resting, could that possibly be an access to you bringing your, uh, when I say awakened, I don't mean like enlightened, but bringing this um, energy that's being cultivated and nourished in yourself, is there a way that you can then go and pay that into society in some small way? You know, you don't have to be like um, going and doing like massive amounts of civil disobedience or going on every single march and protest, but finding some of that nurtured energy that you have cultivated and then putting it towards a cause that you care about. I think when, when it comes to self-care, there can be a fine line of where it becomes self-care, becomes self-absorption. And we fail to see that our own freedom has to be linked with other people's freedom as well. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, because it, it, it's not... I often think that, you know, like I'm a feminist, right? And I just think, well, how can I be a feminist if I don't stand up for mm. other things? There was a, an amazing line in the, in the film called Pride. Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. Oh, you should watch it. It's amazing. I, I, one of my favourite films. The, the main sort of guy in there, he's, he's a, a young gay guy, and he decides that... Um, they're gonna, the gay community in London are going to help minors in Wales who are striking and struggling and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So someone was asking him, like, why do you do it? And he said, well, I can't remember the words. He said it so beautifully. He said that how can I st stand up for my own, gay, my own rights as a gay man? So I can't stand up for gay rights for the gay community if I don't stand up for everybody's rights. And so many people forget that, you know, like, it's not... You can't just fight for what you think you should have without fighting for what everyone should yeah. have. Yeah, totally. And yeah, I really like what you're saying. And I think, um, oh, it's, this is such an important topic and I didn't even know that we were gonna go go down that route, <laughs> but in the, um, the kind of yoga slash spiritual slash kind of wellness community, which is also an industry, like let's not be naive about that. You know, yoga made $50 billion in the wellness industry um, in 2019, I think that statistics from. So it, it is, it has become part of a, a capitalist hamster wheel of money gets spent and then we buy, uh, we use our money to buy products that make us feel better about ourselves and our yoga practice because we might have the right kind of leggings or we've got a snazzy water bottle. Um, but there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who don't have access to even roll out a yoga mat or don't even have access to having um, having five minutes to spend in, in meditation or five minutes just to like watch your breath to start with. And so there isn't really any real wellness until everybody has some access. Everybody has opportunity to find ways to experience just feeling better like just a little bit better, feeling like your, your nervous system isn't ragged most of the time, or feeling like, oh, do you know, I'm really stiff and achy today, but I can't take the morning off from this job that I'm tied to, that's gonna make my aches and pains even worse. So yeah, there, there isn't any real wellness until we've all got access to it. such a massive topic isn't it mm. and I think it can be an unpopular one in again like the yoga and wellness industry because so much and mostly I think rightly so mostly the attention is on the self so in something like mindfulness for example which I, I practice and I think is fucking great and has saved me a lot of times over the attention is is on the self so if you can self-regulate and create space to be able to have a, a response rather than a reaction of course that's going to be helpful to you in life but that isn't going to change the 
extraordinary amounts of inequality that there are in the world, which will take actual groundwork on your feet or by writing a letter to your MP, you know? So there's always within, within yoga for me, there's always a balance of literally make sure that you're nourished, make sure that you're resting, you know? Make sure that you don't just fling yourself out of bed and first thing at six o'clock in the morning, do a vinyasa practice if that isn't literally what your body wants to do at six o'clock in the morning. If it is, carry on. And sometimes that's good for you and sometimes it's not gonna be good for you. Um, but there's doing all of those kind of yoga things, but also what about all the other people that might like to be doing yoga right now, but don't have the opportunity? Yeah, you know, I think you are right in the sense that it is an unpopular view and, and, and very, a lot of people who are very sort of, oh, um, not, I'm not saying this in a disparaging way, but people from the love and light community, they, it's very much a sort of, well, I can't do anything about that, so I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to bring it into my reality. And, and there's, there's truth in that, however, the trouble is, we we put it aside because we find it too overwhelming it's too overwhelming to think about the fact that people don't have the same privileges that you have yeah. people don't have the same opportunities that you have and that you know worse than that that they they're actually suffering things that you could never imagine right but the problem is that unless we talk about everyone i think everyone needs to realize and myself included we can all make a difference in our own way yeah. so for you and me today us making a difference might be having this conversation which someone might listen to who has skills or has contacts or has some you know like some something different maybe a, a passion in a way that's different to mine where they think right I can do something about this you know mm -hmm. and it's like what seeds do you drop definitely that's a lovely way of putting it yeah Oh, I love that. And it's, yeah, sort of going back to this, this you know, the, the topic of, of rest is um, where can you kind of drop the oars or like any ropes that you've been hanging on to in, in your life? You can drop those off, create space, rest. And certainly for me, what I've experienced and I think could be, I don't have any statistics on this or any data, annoyingly, I have a sense that when you are bringing a resting practice into your life, what starts to be uncovered is all of the things that you actually really don't want to be doing, that you do habitually. And then maybe a change might happen where you go, oh, I don't really want to do that social engagement that I've committed myself to like pretty much every week and just do because it's habitual. Do you know what? my my heart and what my connection to everybody else on the planet be they in like different socioeconomic groups from from oneself my connection tells me that i want to do something that that might make a difference so maybe I'll, I'll volunteer for an hour or two hours at a food bank for example instead of doing this social engagement that you don't really want to do if you've got a load of social engagements that you really want to do, don't sack them off, like keep them <laughs> because you don't want to make yourself unhappy or suddenly be like, see you everybody, now that we can all come out and maybe socialize again, I'm just never going to see anyone again. If that's not true for you, like finding what what is good and helpful and is actually aligned. Um, it, it makes me think of something that I wrote in... Um, there's a book called 2020 Vision and I was one of the people that collaborated to write it and it's, it's released by the Unbound Press. And there was a little piece that I wrote in, in my section about something that popped into my head one day called autonomous aligned activism. So you're autonomous because it's, it's under your own kind of guidance, it's under your own rules um, and you can change whatever action you're doing as you see fit. Um, and it's aligned because it, it does kind of chime with you about something that you care about, an issue that you want to take an action on. You know, maybe I just cited the example of writing to your MP. Like, I never used to write to my MP. I was like, oh, I, I stay out of politics. It has nothing for me. It doesn't, it doesn't affect me. And these days I'm like, I don't know how much change I'm going to make by writing to my lovely MP down here in Brighton. But 
there's a sense that when you put your voice out there or your words down on your email and you do write to your MP that actually you are kind of taking a stand for improving the disgusting amount of social injustice that actually is there in the world. So I think there is a connection, even though it could be a kind of weird one to sort of feel into between rest and using the time that you're taking out of your schedule from all the kind of spurious shit that you no longer really want to do and maybe channeling that towards something that you care way more about whether you realize that now or not it might get dropped into your mind during a yoga nidra practice and you think oh i never thought about that before maybe that's something for me to look at yeah you know uh... I, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that you need to give yourself those quiet times in order to like that's when your your creative juice comes up you know like that fire mm. um, that creates change in your, in your life that gives you the ideas that you know drops those little nuggets of inspiration they come up in those times when you give yourself time to rest or to just be idle you know mm. um, oh I love that just for us as women because we idle. are I love that. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I used to, um, I used to be a tutor and a teacher um, when I lived in London and the amount of shit that kids get given for daydreaming and being idle, whereas that's like, that's fertile ground for young people to be discovering like what their wants are, what their interests are. You know, you don't know whether a kid's like sitting in daydreaming, looking out of the classroom window, <laughs> like they could be thinking of drawing like an incredible masterpiece when they get home. They could be thinking about what kind of changes they want to see in their life and how they can make a difference to other people. So I think we have to be careful not to like have a go and, and like you're, you're not at all. You just said the word idle and I just went like, ah, oh, yes, it's such a good thing. When you're idle, you're letting yourself be. And there's just gold that yeah. can come out of those places of just doing nothing. Yeah. You know, I don't know, there are sort of like courses or workshops or like weekend retreats that I've been on where some have been really well designed and some haven't. And I didn't realize about the importance of idle time and reflective time when you're doing a learning process until I went on one. Had it was jammed back for three solid days. You didn't have a moment. And everyone was talking about the fact, oh, it would have been really nice if we'd had, you know, like some chance in the afternoon to maybe have a break or to da 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 da, -da. And it made me think about the fact that, you know, when you're learning something, you need those quiet times in order for your brain to process. Yeah. So when you're in school and you're on break or you're running around on your lunch or anything, that's not that time. Because you're just getting a, getting all that energy up. You're either grabbing your lunch or you're seeing your friends or you're socialising. You don't have that idle time. And the children, it didn't occur to me until you said that. Children get told off for thing, for something that should be built into a quality education process or system. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas when I've been on other things where they've allowed you, they're like, okay, you're, you've alone time or reflective time they call it they'll give it to you a little bit in the maybe the mid-afternoon or something like that and it's just like you're able to think about what you you've been experiencing and what you've been learning and how you can apply it and it like you integrate it yeah you don't if you're not allowed to daydream and think and wonder yeah. in your mind it's on to the next thing forward facing go mode all the time and yeah. you know I, I don't have any children and, you know, I've made a very active choice that that's not something that I, that I want to have. Um, but I worked in education long enough to see just how frazzled young people are. And, and, you know, not just frazzled by the school system, but frazzled by the social system that has you be very connected to these devices that we have at our beck and core that have basically just become like an extra appendage on the end of our hands. Um, and so, yeah, all the pressures around that. Um, going back to what you were saying about how, you know, there, there needs to be kind of reflection or even like rest that's properly built into like curriculum time. Um, 
I thought about something or kind of discovered this within a group on the weekend. I, I went to a totally brilliant um, yoga teacher training just for, it was like a whole afternoon. And um, again, kind of coming from this sort of change slash social responsibility sort of um, space. It was a training which was looking at how to support students who come to either group classes or that you do one-to-one -one yoga with um, who have had COVID or in the or having long COVID. Because many of the kind of traditional and and very good, like very helpful, you know, not to like throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, very good and cleansing sometimes breath techniques are just not helpful for people who have got long COVID. Um, so we were having the, the training on, on this particular topic and just looking at some um, asana, some body position that can be very conducive to starting to create like the nasal breathing and diaphragmatic breathing. And um, one of my favorite yoga shapes is makrasana, which is crocodile pose. So literally just lying on your tummy, your chest can um, generally be off the ground, but you make a pillow for your forehead, rest your forehead down on your hands and just really gently just ease down the skin, which is above your eyebrows. So I used to see that all the time when I was teaching in schools, kids would just have their head down on the desk like this. And it was really ingrained to be like, oh, you need to sit up and show that you're paying attention or well, actually no, what if bodily and somatically that young person, whether they were conscious to it or not, was showing that they were a bit overwhelmed and that they needed a break. So they knew to put their head down. They knew to rest their eyebrow line on their hands because that does give a little bit of a break, like a pause to the thinking mind. Because obviously so much here is... um the newest part of our brain, the cortex and the prefrontal cortex, which is so much of our like rationalization, our thinking and our, you know, our to-do list like lives here, right? So if you're resting this part, you're literally creating space to get a bit of a break from that. And I just thought it was really interesting because we were talking again in this in this teacher training on the weekend about um, about how rest is really important for recovery, like not even just recovery from doing exercise or, you know, recovery from um, a kind of dynamic style yoga class. Right. But also what about the rest that is super, super nourishing that we need to have in our daily lives that could potentially be very relieving for people that have been unwell with COVID and long COVID, but also not having a go at kids for just showing us when they really just need to take a break <laughs> like this. Yeah. It's bonkers. It's almost as if we're educating natural, healthy coping mecha mechanisms out of the population at school. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, Sarah, tell me a little bit about. <laughs> feel like so I was going to ask you. Tell me a little bit about your book. Mm. Um. So yeah, where to start with Shadow and Rose? So the the title of the book is Shadow and Rose: A Soulful Guide for Women Recovering from Rape and Sexual Violence. Um, so there, therein that tells you the subject matter of the book. Um, of course, if, if you're listening to this interview and this isn't something that you, like, it feels like good and safe for you to hear about right now, then maybe just pause the interview for a little bit um, and, and come back in sort of nearer the end because, you know, I obviously don't want to say anything that's going to be triggering difficult feelings or, or trauma for people. Um, so I wrote the book during the lockdown last year and in truth, I say that I started writing it then, like I physically did. I opened my laptop to start doing the writing in March last year. But I've been kind of writing the book in note form over like a number of years, like from like 2016 onwards. Um, and I was, um, I was violently assaulted at a music festival Obviously, I'm not going to go into details. Um, and so I started a recovery process from PTSD after that 
event, which the amazing therapist that I was very privileged enough to be able to spend time having healing with um, at the Havens, one of the Havens recovery centers in London, you know, one of the first times that we, we met each other and we started having a session, she um, <laughs> kind of pinpointed it straight away because we, we hadn't really talked about the attack and that's not really what goes on in like um, in good trauma therapy. We just talked about some other stuff that had happened in my life before then. And she was like, I think you're already living in PTSD even before this event happened to you. And I'd never stopped to consider that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think she was right. I think we often can walk around with a very overly activated sympathetic nervous system that can keep one very much in fight or flight a lot of the time, um, but also can bring up the other sensations which are to do with trying to protect oneself when there's a dangerous thing that's happening, which would be the, the freeze response and going into hyper arousal as opposed to hyper arousal. Um, and then also there's a fourth response that isn't so much talked about. And it's still something that I, I know that I've experienced and kind of acted on in, in previous years in life, but I'm taking a bit of time to kind of research and read about it now. It's called the fawn response. And the fawn response um, happens when you try to kind of appease the situation or the person that has been um, like threatening or dangerous towards you. So there's fight, flight, fawn or freeze and all of those aspects of um, uh, the central nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system response all come into play in CPTSD and complex PTSD and, C and, and PTSD. So it was kind of like when I started writing my little bits of notebook back in 2016, it was almost like a diary to try and help myself come through the symptoms of, of PTSD, which would be anything from um, nightmares, um, really visceral, real flashbacks, like in the daytime, grinding anxiety to the point where it'd be like, I can't even bear to go outside because of the creeping fear that something terrible was going to happen again. Again, very sympathetic nervous system heavy, <laughs> very switched on. Um, and then, you know, the also the, just like the grief that goes with being on the receiving end of, of an attack like that. Um, so yeah, I was writing the book as a kind of healing process as diary entries to start with. And I didn't know that it was gonna be a book when I was doing my writing. It was literally just like journaling to try and get all the mess of thoughts and real like negativity that was going on for me from my head down onto a page to kind of like, bleh, like blurt it out. Um, and then like the more I got better, I kind of put the book away, like the notebook, and I kind of didn't want to sort of keep like going back to it and revisiting it because kind of going back over something when it's to do with trauma is not a conducive way to help healing. Sometimes you'll, you'll need to look at it within a proper trained therapy session of someone who can really support what it is to let the body and mind and spirit recover from trauma. But it's not super helpful to keep going over like the details of it, um, which is what often happens when you report a crime like that to the police and you have to keep talking about it over and over again. So those kind of um, the methodology that um, the justice system uses to try and determine whether the person who harmed you should be going to prison or not are very untrauma informed, shall we say. So that's something that I brought into um, into the book as well. So when I was putting Shadow and Rose together, I was like, I do want to address the fact that people could be in a place in their recovery from rape and sexual violence where they may be considering reporting to the police or they might not be wanting to do that and I think it's really important to validate just where people are and not ever bring your own agenda into whether a person should be like reporting or not. Um, so yeah there's lots of different content in Shadow and Rose but mainly going into sort of the, the typical, and I say quote unquote typical areas because all recovery is different, um, but sort of going into um, the impact of shame, like ongoingly, and the importance of finding somebody to work through shame with, um, the negative self-talk that a person might find themselves 
talking to themselves about some of these um ah oh, what's the word for it um strongly held beliefs and societal views about somehow victims of rape and sexual violence somehow brought it on themselves or deserved it i definitely found myself going over those in my head and you know i was always a person who'd be like i would never think like that about myself well you just don't know until it happens to you and then the mind does its tricks you know um so how to like work through those kind of inner dialogues that can happen um, and also talking about how to start seeking out help if you think that you are experiencing PTSD. Um, and that's all like really, really heavy stuff, but I promise you the book has a hopeful message. It's not all doom and gloom, even though, you know, it's a very challenging subject to read about and it was really challenging and healing for me to write about as well. Um, and then also woven into the book are different kinds of reflective journaling practices and resting practices, some yoga nidra practices as well that are, they're all housed on my website and people can find that through like a private area that's on my site that the book will give you access to. Um, so yeah, that, that came out as a self-published book just in March this year. So I just hope that it's found by the right people who need to find it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. I feel um I I <laughs> I want to ask you another question, but I feel like we need a respectful pause. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna plow on. Um could you tell me, because I'm really interested in the title, like what inspired the title? Mm, love this, yeah. Um, shadow and Rose. I think the shadow part came to me after I'd been having a therapy session, actually. Um, and let's relate it back to, to what we were saying before about the kind of um, like wellness or sort of spiritual community. Um, there is nothing wrong with a bit of love and light. Big fan, but it's not the whole story when it comes to healing. Um, particularly from um, traumatic events. And I, I'm talking like any kind of trauma load that a person has. It doesn't have to be from like one event. It could be myriad like micro traumas that a person might experience from, from being very young and then growing up. And um, what the shadow represented for me was those parts of myself that I'd started to disown because in having different traumas kind of build up over time, there were little bits of myself that I kind of didn't like and didn't want to really look into for fear of just kind of spiraling down this rabbit hole and thinking, Jesus, how am I ever gonna get out of this? Like if I, it's the kind of worms analogy, if I open this up, how am I ever gonna get all these worms back in this can and make it look like I've got some semblance of normality? So I think the shadow, for human beings is often to do with um to do with our grief it's to do with anger rage even it's definitely to do with shame and those are the kind of areas where it is very helpful to have a like i love this expression it's from um there's this amazing book called medicine woman by lucy pierce she talks about having a healing ally so having a healing ally like a proper counselor psychotherapist, trauma worker, to help you come through these shadowy areas. And shadowy doesn't even need to have like a negative connotation. If I thought that was the case, I wouldn't have made it as the first word in the title of my book if I thought it was a negative thing. But the shadow really has so, so, so much to teach us about what it means to go forward and grow and possibly even thrive in the rest of life. Um, so that's the shadow part hope that makes sense. Um, and then roses. Yeah, I tell a kind of mini story in the opening bits of the book. Um, again, after I'd had a session at the wonderful Havens um, clinic. Um, I should say about the Havens, they are part of King's College Hospital in London and they have sites in Camberwell, Whitechapel and Paddington. 
So you can self-refer if you've been affected by sexual violence and, and want to actually get some guidance on just to talk to start with, not even get any guidance, but just to say what's happened to you. And they have very incredible trained clinicians and doctors who are there to support you with whatever you, you want your recovery to look like. Um, so I'd had a session there and my brilliant therapist was like, we had a hard session today. That was pretty heavy. You should go and do something nice for yourself. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I should go and do something nice for myself now. And I didn't really know what it was going to be. Um, and then I walked, um, I had to go into the Sainsbury's in Whitechapel, which is just behind where the Havens is. And I saw the roses in the florist bit at the start, like where you walk into the supermarket. And I can't remember if they were yellow or pink, it would have been one of those two colors. Um, and I saw them and it was like, I swear to God, they spoke to me. It was like, you need us. And actually we need you today as well. So I bought this small bunch of roses, like one of those like small five pound bunches that you can get. And I just remember looking down at them when I was in the queue to pay for them, this swirling pattern inside it. It was like, you know, one of those like mathematical shapes, like an infinity swirl. It's got a proper name. I can't think what it is. Um, but it just felt like that was the shape that I needed to see at that time. Like that's what my eyes wanted and it's what my brain wanted. And it was definitely what my heart wanted at that time too, to see this unfurling, soft, feminine, flowing pattern. And um, yeah, I was hooked on roses since that time. And then it was like everywhere I went in London, there was just roses everywhere. And I promise you, I had never ever noticed so many roses around me before then. Um, and looking back, I've always had a thing for roses. I used to make like rose water perfume in my mum and dad's garden by just like, it's terrible really, like butchering the petals off the rose bushes, sticking it in water in a jam jar and then just leaving it for a day or so. And it would just have like the subtlest hint of rose petal kind of aroma. But that was enough for me and I, you know, I put it like on my face and on my neck and stuff when I was little. And so buying those roses in, in the Sainsbury's, it was really like I had a, a kind of memory jog of how much I felt connected to that particular flower when I was little. And the touch of them, the smell of them, the, you know, I like to put roses on my face and just rub them next to my cheek because they feel so soft. And it felt really, really welcoming. Um, so yeah, in the book, I've, I've mentioned roses quite a bit and find the nearest rose or draw yourself a rose or write something about a rose or, you know, there's there's guided meditations that have roses very much at the forefront as well. So that's your title. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a plant medicine, the rose is sort of very... Um, it's, well, I would. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is love, and to me, it's, it seems like if you're going, th if you're going through um, things that you talk about in your book, then Rose would be perfect for that because it's kind of encouraging you to love yourself, to give mm. yourself that love back. So where you might be doubting yourself, where you might look upon yourself in a way that is really not helpful and not reflective of reality, mm. Rose would come in as a, as a healing medicine and be like, no, come on, you're worthy of love. And that softness, that mothering energy that you're talking about when you looked at the Rose and everything like that, it's just everything you need to nourish yourself in a difficult mm. time. So true, you know, and yeah, just hearing what you've said just then, I think um, one of the little kind of mantras I had for myself, like I, this is robbed from someone else and I can't remember who I heard it from, but you know, when I was getting better, when there were days that were just really, really super hard and it would be like, okay, just take the next five minutes and then the next five minutes and then the next 10 minutes and just, you know, put one foot in front of the other. Um, those really tender spots of feeling very, um, very low, like very depressed, very um, almost numb actually to life. Having roses around if I could, and that wasn't always possible, you know, I didn't always have money to be able to spend on roses, um, but having them around was like a reminder for where I just needed to pour more love like onto, onto those wounds. And it felt for a while that I was kind of this big wound, like just walking around. 
And so this, again, like you said, the softness of those rose petals is really like a balm, like whether I touched it onto my skin or just like let my eyes rest on a rose for a little bit. It's, yeah, extremely healing. Yeah. Wow. Sarah, thank you so much for, for sharing so openly. Um, if there was one thing that you could say to someone who might be thinking about whether to get your book or having gone through any kind of trauma that we've been speaking about, what would it, what would that thing be? I think um, <laughs> this is just so an answer to a lot of questions, I think, and it's, it's not meant to be like a kind of say this and you'll feel better or it's not even like a, it exists for me on a deeper level than like a, an, an affirmation or something to kind of just repeat to yourself. But at any stage of your healing process, be it the start or it could be years down the line, that it's all got to be at your own pace and to allow yourself or to relearn actually how to be autonomous about how your healing goes. And underneath all of that is just the underpinning phrase that that you're enough and what you're doing is enough. And if you can even consider for just a, a nanosecond of time that who you are is enough, that you deserve to recover and you deserve to live free from um, yeah, like you deserve to live free from abuse and um, danger that you might have previously found yourself in or either once or over a sustained period of time. Um, you are enough and that you deserve the help to come through. And that, you know, there are people who are incredibly skilled, professionally, medically well trained to help you recover. Um, and as, yeah, it's just like a starting point for, for recovery and again, further down the line, um, go to the people that have got proper training, go to people that can prove to you that they are skilled and well-read in trauma and how to help a person navigate and be autonomous within their healing process. And a, yeah, a good place to look for that is, um, there's some good resources on the MIND website. Okay. Coming through PTSD. Um, and also anyone can look up the Havens as well. The actual website address, I forget right now, but it's very Googleable. you'll find it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. So if people want to get in touch with you, um, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, definitely the best way and to have like, a proper email back and forth with me would be through my mailing list which is um yeah you can register for the mailing list which is on my website at youreenoughyoga.com i'm sometimes found on instagram but i'm not a prolific poster or a commenter or responder or messenger <laughs> by any means um used to be i'm trying to kind of wean myself away from that for myriad different reasons um, mainly to do with the fact that I don't want people to make money out of my attention span or anybody else's for as much as it can be avoided. Um, so yeah, mailing list at youreenoughyoga.com. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, really. Thank you so much. I, you know, I didn't know that we were going to end up discussing like half of the stuff that we did and I'm kind of like, did this make sense? What was I saying? But I hope some things have come through as like, vaguely cogent yeah no it was I didn't know what we were going to get into either but it's been really really interesting and I, I think the subjects that we spoke on actually she, each of them could be a whole hour in, in and of itself you know um so yeah no I enjoyed it me too thank you